For any criminal, it's of the utmost importance that no one ever knows about his or her crimes if they wish to remain free. Anything and everything that could lead back to them and connect them to their wrongdoing must be disposed of properly. And they know this, and yet there are some criminals who can't help themselves but to keep a little momentum of their horrific deeds. Killers like Jeffrey Dahmer, Joel Rifkin, Ted Bundy, and the Dallas Ripper, just to mention a few, became so enamored with their own crimes that they made special efforts to take souvenirs and trophies from their victims, something that will always help them to remember what they've done. Welcome to Scary Mysteries, guys. I'm Andrew Fitzgerald, and please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so that we can keep creating more videos like these for you. And hopefully, with your help, we can reach that 1 million subscriber mark. You know, we can't do it without you, so thank you very much. And now, here are five killers who kept their victims' rings as souvenirs. Number five, Anatoly Onoprienko. People call him the beast from Ukraine. Full of arrogance and feelings of indifference towards others, the Ukrainian Terminator would literally send shivers down anyone's spine with the mere mention of his name. Anatoly's childhood can best be described as one full of gloom and sadness. He was only seven when he was sent to an orphanage. And he went on to become a failed forestry student Later on, he found a job as a sailor, but during all these times, he had been fighting bouts of mental illnesses, forcing him to be admitted to mental hospitals from time to time. From 1989 to 1996, Anon Prienko reportedly murdered a whopping 52 people, men, women, children, and even babies. These multiple killings followed a distinctive set of patterns wherein he would always choose homes that were isolated and oftentimes lying on the outskirts of town. After picking his spot, this beast of a man would then enter the residence while everyone was sleeping. Once awake, he would round them up into the living room and then, using his signature 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun, he would shoot each one of them at close range. There were also some times when he would use an ax or a hammer after he had had his fill, he would then set fire to the house along with its dead owners. He was clearly a person not to mess with, and during his murderous outbursts, he wouldn't hesitate to kill whoever he came across in his path, be it a stranger, a straggler, just anyone, even a police officer. Most of the time, Anna Prienko would steal valuables from his victims, that included money and jewels, his preferred item to take were rings. During one of his rampages, he killed a couple while they were inside their car and then cut their wedding rings off and gave them to his then-girlfriend who he lived with. News of the massacre committed by this lone sadistic killer struck fear in Ukrainians' countryside. As such, more than 2,000 members of the country's law enforcement agencies were scattered throughout to catch the perpetrator. But he was able to avoid arrest, that is, until 1996, when authorities received an anonymous tip. On April 16th of that year, police captured Anna Prienko at his girlfriend's apartment in a village near the Polish border. People have been begging for his life as payment for his terrifying crimes, but because there's a moratorium on the death penalty in Ukraine, he instead received a life in jail. In 2013, the country's worst criminal then died of a heart attack at the age of 54. Anna Prienko's lust for blood was unlike any other, and this remained even after he was already apprehended. When he was interviewed during his trial, he told the public that they need to contain him, otherwise he would continue to wreak havoc. One can only imagine what further horror and brutalities he could have unleashed had he not been imprisoned. Number four, William Kerr. The infamous killer, William Kerr, may not have the most expansive portfolio of crimes and killings, but make no mistake, this man from Bridlington, England, 
is no ordinary criminal. Kerr and his friend, Christopher Moody, were once living in a house owned by Maureen Comfort in Leeds. The two men lived there for about two months sometime in 1995. Miss Comfort was last seen alive by her family, relatives, and friends in December of that year. The 43-year-old then went missing for several weeks, and this concerned much of her folks who, in January of 96, decided to break into her flat. Kerr and Moody were nowhere to be found, and the place was completely empty. Upon a deeper search, there they found the deteriorating body of comfort stashed in a closet of her own bedroom. Police were called and medical examiners confirmed that she was strangled to death, and an investigation ensued, and they were able to arrest both Kerr and Moody for the ghastly crime. The pair was eventually jailed for life by the Leeds Crown Court. Kerr, on his part, served 15 years in prison before he was eventually released on license. You see, in the UK, they have what they call being released on license conditions. This means that an inmate is still serving his or her prison sentence, only that they can live in an approved community inside of a penitentiary. For reasons that have yet to be known, Kerr was one of those granted with such a privilege, and this was where more problems began to unfold. Because in April of 2015, he then fled from an accommodation in Hull, which sparked a major police manhunt, and had it not been for the public's help, he would have remained at large. He was imprisoned again, but for some unbelievable circumstance, he was once again released with conditions in 2017. Then, same as the first time, he also managed to get away. Authorities once again scampered, and he was eventually returned to his cell. During bold times, police have been warning the community to never approach what they called a very dangerous man. And you might not believe it, but then, in August of 2020, Kerr was released from prison on license again. This time, while free, he committed another heinous crime. In June of 2021, the now 60-year-old approached a stranger whom he had been asking for food. Suddenly, the fugitive turned violent and he held a knife on the man's throat while demanding money. He and his helpless victim went to the latter's house where he ordered the safe to be opened. Kerr then emptied all of its contents, including the man's most prized possession, the wedding ring of his late wife. After getting what he wanted, he made the victim get down on his knees. He then tied his hands and left the property. The unnamed man reportedly developed PTSD having gone through such an ordeal. And Kerr now remains at large and the police have once again warned the public of his dangerous presence. No one knows for sure what drove authorities to release Kerr so many times when they were aware of what he was capable of, but we can only hope that once again, he'll be found sooner rather than later, and this time, they won't let him go. Number three, Joseph D'Angelo. He was a serial killer, a rapist, and a burglar from California, who we've now come to be known as the Golden State Killer. Joseph James D'Angelo committed heinous acts between 1974 and 1986. His M.O. was to stalk neighborhoods at night searching for unsuspecting women who were alone at their house. He would then pry open windows and doors to let himself in. And once inside, he would ransack everything that was valuable. And then when he felt like it, he would sexually assault his female victims. Most of the time, they'd get killed afterwards. He got away with everything he did. And by the early to mid 80s, D'Angelo then became bolder and more vicious in his ways. He then began targeting couples and he would tie both of them up. Once they were restrained, he would rape the female and then murder the two later on. The Vietnam War veteran was eventually convicted of at least 13 murders and 50 rape cases, and police did suspect that the number could be higher considering the extent of his area of influence. 
In Sacramento, he became known as the East Area Rapist, having sexually assaulted at least 37 female victims. And chaos further ensued when the original Night Stalker, as he was eventually called, wreaked havoc in Contra Costa County, Stockton, and Modesto. These are the places where he supposedly racked up his body count. Meanwhile, it was in San Joaquin Valley where he reportedly began his life of crime as a burglar. He became known as the Vasilia Ransacker. The former Exeter police officer would break into homes and steal high-value items such as earrings, cufflinks, medallions, and rings, all of which he would keep. It would take more than 30 years before authorities finally got to arrest the now so-called Golden State Killer. In 2018, police employed genetic genealogy, which was then a new DNA forensics technique. This method takes the DNA left behind at a crime scene and identifies that unknown suspect by tracing that to an ever-expanding public genealogy database. In 2018, D'Angelo was finally captured. He was already in his mid-70s at that time. Arresting officers said that, interestingly enough, the loot that he took from each of his victims were still found intact inside his home, and they were never sold. They believe that he simply kept them as remembrance of his heists. Despite the extent of his crimes and the pleading of the families of his victims, he was spared the death penalty and was instead given life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the reading of his sentence, D'Angelo asked for forgiveness, but the lives he took, the damage he'd done, and the horror he caused will forever be etched as one of the worst in American criminal history. Number two, George Russell. Friends and acquaintances described George Russell to be an easygoing man, good looking, and a charmer. He certainly knew how to mingle with people and make them feel good in his company, but that was all a facade. Born into a broken family, the sly teenager constantly had run ins with the law, mostly involving petty thefts and burglaries. And police were actually so accustomed with his misdemeanors that they eventually decided to offer him a job at their station. Thinking this could be his chance to change his life, he instead used the new status to further exploit others. He was good at talking with women, and he had many girlfriends. However, there were times when things didn't go his way and he got rejected. And Russell was having none of that. In June of 1990, Mary Polrick, a Bellevue, Washington resident, was found dead and her body abandoned in the parking lot. Medical examiners confirmed she was brutally beaten, kicked in the stomach, and then strangled to death. And witnesses and police responders were taken aback when they saw the crime scene. The victim's arms and legs were crossed as if she had been put in a coffin. She had a plastic bag that was covering her head. Friends of the 27-year-old said that they saw the woman flirting with Russell, but as what she usually does, she dumped him when the night was over. It was later revealed in court that the woman blatantly rejected the man's sexual advances. Out of frustration, Russell then forcefully escorted her to a pickup truck where she was raped and later on murdered. A little more than a month after Polrick's murder, a woman named Carol Ann Beeth, also a Bellevue resident, was found dead in her own apartment. Her head was so severely bashed in that her skull was shaped like the letter Y. Unlike the first, though, Russell sexually assaulted this female after she was dead. He then positioned the mother of two in such a way that her crotch would face the bedroom. He had inserted into her genitalia a 22 long rifle that she kept under her bed. The third and probably the most brutal of all murders he committed was of Andrea Levine, though. On September 3rd, 1990, the killer bashed the 24-year-old's head with so much force that her brain scattered throughout her bed. She was also covered with a total of 231 knife wounds from head to toe. A plastic sex toy was shoved down her throat, and a book titled More Joy of Sex was in her hand. 
Russell's habit, though, eventually it would help put an end to his rampage. Because apparently, in two of the murders, he would get the rings off his victims as trophies of his kills. Through sperm analysis and by tracking down those rings, police were able to identify the so-called Bellevue Killer. Then, in September of 1990, Russell was arrested and sentenced to life in prison in October of that same year. Had Russell not been apprehended and locked up, who knows how long, how brutal, and how many he would have actually killed. Number 1. Peter Tobin Criminal psychologists surmise that it's very rare, if not unlikely, for a law-abiding, middle-aged person to suddenly commit a crime as ghastly as murder. When UK's infamous serial killer, Peter Tobin, was arrested in 2006, investigators were surprised to see a 60-year-old man in front of them as the one responsible for such horrific crimes. The main victim that got him caught was Angelica Kluke, who, in September of 2006, had disappeared and five days later, her body was found under the floorboards of a church. Medical examinations indicated that the victim was beaten and raped before finally being stabbed to death. The 23-year-old Polish student was last seen in the company of Tobin, who, at this point, had assumed a different identity. Police were able to track down the Scottish killer, and with overwhelming forensic evidence stacked against him, he was ultimately convicted of a murder. He was already given a life sentence, but authorities couldn't seem to put their finger as to why he did the crime, and they suspected that there was more to this man than what meets the eye. And so, police launched a probe with the purpose of examining his past. And there, the eventual findings were shocking, and it was as if they had opened a huge chest brimming with secrets. They discovered that Tobin had killed two teenage girls Vicki Hamilton, and Dinah McNichol. The body of the 15-year-old Hamilton, whom he raped and murdered in 1991, was first discovered buried in the back garden of his former home in Bathgate, Scotland. In an effort to cover his tracks, he then left for Kent in southeast England. But along the way, he picked up and murdered 18-year-old McNichol. Like the first, she too was raped and stabbed to death. Moreover, she was also buried in the back of the killer's former property. For both cases, the inmate received life sentences, which he's currently serving at prison in Edinburgh. Another point of interest, though, in Tobin's story is his panache for souvenirs. Investigators said that he liked to take precious items like earrings, necklaces, and rings from his victims. This shouldn't come as a big surprise considering that, when he was still young, he had been arrested several times and convicted for burglary and theft. Meanwhile, criminologists couldn't seem to get over the rumor that Tobin could actually be the notorious Bible John. Bible John's story and criminal exploits deserve an episode of their own, but suffice to say, this killer wreaked havoc around the late 1960s in Glasgow, Scotland. Being from the same country, the public couldn't help but suspect that the two could be the same person. Adding more to this fact is the resemblance of Tobin's younger self to the artist's impressions of the still unidentified killer. Also, just like Tobin, this so-called religious murderer had killed three women. Whether Bible John could really be Peter Tobin, that truth is yet to be revealed. So as of now, the murders of three young Scottish women will remain unsolved. If you enjoyed this, then please go ahead and check out some of our other videos on killers and true crime because we have a lot of them. Thanks so much for tuning in. We appreciate you guys very much and hope to see you in the next one.